Bienvenido, welcome. I'm Madeline DiNono, President and CEO of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media. We want to thank our longstanding partnership with UNICEF as we are united in our missions to ensure that our children flourish and can be inspired to dream and achieve endless possibilities. We also want to thank the Spotlight Initiative. Advertising is one of the most powerful agents of change and we're very excited for you to learn about our keen insights from our latest study from Mexico and the Caribbean, as well as an update on the success from our India advertising study. So without further ado, please welcome our founder and chair, Gina Davis. Hello everyone. Thank you so much to our members, partners and guests for joining us here today. And a big welcome to those joining us from around the globe. We have guests tuning in from Mexico, the Caribbean, Spain, Costa Rica, Sweden, Heido, just to name a few. Welcome. We're thrilled to have this opportunity to present today for the first time, the findings of our latest global research, a review of advertising in Mexico and the Caribbean and its links to gender equality, gender norms, and violence against women and girls. Without the support of our partners at UNICEF and the Spotlight Initiative, this research could not have happened, so thank you. UNICEF's ongoing commitment to eliminate all forms of violence against children, girls, and women is vital. And we hope this new, and we hope this new study will inspire the advertising and marketing community, civil society, and governments to take targeted actions to ensure that the powerful influence advertisements have on society will be leveraged to advance gender equality and human rights for all. On that note, we know that advertising has a powerful influence on gender socialization, how people learn and internalize gender norms. Through television and other digital platforms, we are exposed to a barrage of messages that shape our perceptions of what gender roles and behaviors are considered to be appropriate. This, re this report reinforces the notion that promoting positive gender socialization through advertising helps ensure that children, girls, and women consume media that support positive, inclusive, and diverse social norms, rather than perpetuating discriminatory stereotypes that lead to negative outcomes. In just a few minutes, Dr. Meyer and Dr. Conroy, leaders of our research team, will walk us through the findings. But first, it is my pleasure to introduce some of our partners to give a few words. Please welcome Lauren Rumble, Global Associate Director, Gender Equality for UNICEF, and Erin Kenny, Senior Advisor and Head of the Technical Unit of the Spotlight Initiative. Over to you, Lauren and Erin. Greetings, everyone. I believe Lauren will be joining us shortly. Um, so I'm going to kick it off just with deep gratitude to UNICEF, to the Gina Davis Institute, and to my colleagues working tirelessly on the Spotlight Initiative in the Caribbean region and Mexico for this amazing study that will really transform the way that we do work with the media in the region. We know that violence against women and girls is preventable. It requires a holistic approach that, it, that challenges the social norms that allow violence to thrive. The divisions that we face in society are formed and reinforced through these social norms, behaviors, and practices. To address this, it is essential to promote favorable social norms, including through media-based partnerships and interventions. Changing norms requires diffusion of ideas to a critical mass of people, enough to shift both the reality and perception of what's normal in that community. The media plays a crucial role in either reinforcing or challenging community attitudes and norms that condone violence. For that reason, the Spotlight Initiative has collaborated closely with the media through campaigns, public service announcements, radio, TV, printed publications, and social media to debunk gender stereotypes and raise awareness about women and girls' rights. Okay. At the global level, the Spotlight Initiative launched the With Her campaign, to raise awareness on ending violence against women and girls and challenge gender stereotypes. With the participation of international content creators, United Nations leaders, and civil society partners, 
the campaign has reached more than 146 million users on social media. This includes the With Her Talks with prominent social media influencers to address gender inequality and violence against women and girls. Right now, you can find part one of a three-part series by a famous chef discussing gender discrimination in restaurants. And that's gonna be on, on Spotlight's Instagram account. I'll end with an example of our work in Argentina that directly relates to the findings of this study. The Yomi Ocupo, I Take Care of It initiative promoted conversations amongst men about their role at home and made visible the burden of thinking, planning and coordinating household and care tasks that has on women. <clears throat> the campaign was a trending topic on the day of its launch, circulated extensively on WhatsApp and was broadcast widely through traditional media, ultimately expanding to 28 countries. The potent alchemy of research, activism, and media engagement can have a tangible impact on shifting the norms that condone violence. I'm looking forward to taking this critical research forward into action. Thank you so much. And I'm hoping I can kick it over to Lauren. Over to you, Lauren. Hello, everybody. I'm so delighted to meet you. And thank you, Erin, a dear friend and fantastic champion of gender equality and child rights. It's really, really wonderful to join more than 150 of you here today. What a fantastic turnout. My name is Lauren Rumble, and I head up the gender equality division here at UNICEF based in New York. I wonder if I can start with a question and please feel free to pop in your replies into the chat. How many of you woke up today to media. I know I was checking the soccer scores, the protests in Iran, the new law on sexual violence underway in Indonesia, and certainly my day was shaped by it. If we can just take a moment to reflect on in just a couple of hours that you've been awake, how many times you've checked media, what you've seen in it, and how it's influenced your day even subconsciously. We know, as Erin said, that the media pays an incredibly powerful way a role in shaping our perceptions and ultimately our realities. The research that we're going to be discussing today is important because it reminds us of that fact. And it reminds us too that what the media is representing is not always positive. It's, we, the research has found that overwhelmingly women are depicted in the media as largely caretakers and caregivers, as well as objects of sexual desire. Men, by contrast, are leaders and providers. What kinds of messages does that send to young people, the 600 million adolescent girls, for example, who are poised to take on the world as future change makers, leaders, politicians, scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs? It tells them that your future is limited, that you simply have to be boxed into these categories of definitions. And young people are urgently trying to break out of those stereotypes and disrupt those norms. The second reason that the research is super important for us right now is it reminds us how um, it justifies those discriminatory norms around male and female roles in society and the lack of opportunity, um, therefore, for us to change them. It talks about the justification that we have around violence against women and girls, the acceptance, the widespread acceptance of it. We know that less than 10% of girls, boys, and children of diverse gender identities ever report sexual violence crimes, seldom seek help, and seldom get the quality care that they need. Why is that? Because an incredibly large number, including amongst young people, almost half of young people around the world accept violence as normal and even worse, justified. And the media is a terrible ally on this front. We can turn that around. We, can, we are going to hear from the Gina Davis Institute of how we can make that reality different for young people today how we can actually um, really work together with the media to make violence no longer acceptable, to really disrupt those social norms um, and start changing the narrative 
uh, for the future of young people everywhere. I'm certainly looking forward to it. We have loved the collaboration with all the partners represented here today. We're so lucky um, to really have this research grounded in country realities, to have both quantitative and qualitative data ahead of us so that we can really shape um, our advocacy and champion work going forward. Thank you for having me and for your patience with the tech glitches. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Lauren and Erin. Really important information. Everyone, please check out the uh, With Her you know, campaign. And now it is my great, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Meredith Conroy, um, who leads all research and insights through the Institute, and Dr. Michelle Meyer to present the findings from our Mexico and Caribbean reports. Over to you, Meredith and Michelle. Thank you, Madeline. We're gonna pull up our presentation. Great. All right, thank you, Madeline. And, and thank you, Aaron and Lauren for your remarks and for supporting this research. Um, as Madeline said, my name is Meredith Conroy. I'm the Vice President of Research and Insights at the Institute. And I'm going to introduce these studies and then I'll pass it to Dr. Meyer, um, our Senior Researcher, excuse me, our Senior Director of Research and Methodologies to present our findings. <clears throat> but first, um, the slide is, sorry, there we go, thanks. But first, we wanna acknowledge the many partners who came together to make this research possible, such as PCI Media, whose partnerships in the Caribbean and Mexico provided us with background research and access to the advertising that we study for these reports. These studies provide the first systematic analysis of gender representation and advertising in the Caribbean and Mexico. Our analysis focused on advertising focuses on advertising because advertising is ubiquitous and thus culturally and socially influential. As has already been expressed, um, there are many reasons to, to care about what we see in advertising by those who spoke before me. It is our hope that these studies will serve as a benchmark for assessing gendered behavior and stereotypes in advertising in these regions, and that the findings will lead to more gender conscientious and deliberate portrayals in future advertising. Advertising can have a negative impact on women and girls by reinforcing discriminatory gender norms. Discriminatory gender norms are informal rules and shared social expectations that distinguish expected behavior on the basis of gender. There's a growing body of evidence illustrating the link between discriminatory gender norms and violence against women and girls. These norms can motivate and normalize violence against women and girls. While advertising can reinforce discriminatory gender norms, it can also challenge it and therefore promote gender, promote gender equality and continue, excuse me, and contribute to ending violence against women and girls. In this study, in these studies, we asked, does advertising in Mexico and the Caribbean reinforce or challenge discriminatory gender norms? To answer these questions, we conducted an analysis of ads in Mexico and the Caribbean. I'm going to pass it to Michelle now to present our findings. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. We looked at advertising in Mexico and in the Caribbean, ads from Barbados, Jamaica, St. Lucia, and Trinidad and Tobago. For both sides, we analyzed, for both studies rather, we analyzed individual characters across hundreds of advertisements, resulting in over 3,000 characters in the Caribbean and over 1,500 in Mexico. In analyzing advertising data, we find evidence of harmful gender norms and stereotypes. To illustrate how these norms appear, I begin with an overview of how men and women are shown across multiple identities. Then I'll share stereotypes that appeared in the data and discuss the implications for how these stereotypes can motivate and normalize violence against women and girls. Men and women appear in ads at similar rates with slightly more women than men. There were no non-binary characters in the Caribbean advertisements and less than 1% in the Mexican advertisements. When examining gender by age, we find that women skew younger than men in both regions. This aligns with the idea of youthification or cultural norms that value youth and innocence in women and age and experience in men. Eurocentric beauty standards value light skin, especially in women. In the Caribbean, women were more likely to, than men to be represented with medium or light skin tones, and men were more likely to be shown with darker skin tones. In Mexican ads, all tones skewed lighter, reflecting the implicit belief that people with light skin are more attractive, virtuous, and desirable. In reality, research indicates that according to self-reported data, 
population of Mexico has much more skin tone diversity than we observe here. Characters in these advertisements were primarily cisgender, heterosexual, thin, and non-disabled. The erasure of people who fall outside of these norms contributes to their symbi symbolic annihilation, the implicit message that they do not hold any cultural value. Such erasure fails to challenge transphobia, homophobia, fatphobia, and ableism, and further stigmatizes women and girls who are members of these marginalized groups leaving them more vulnerable to abuse. For example, research shows that disability is a compounding risk factor for women and girls and their potential for experiencing violence. The study's findings on the prevalence of gender stereotypes in advertisements particular, are particularly concerning given the high rates of violence against women and girls in Mexico and the Caribbean. Thankfully, we find very few instances of explicit violence or harm in these ads. However, the ads do reinforce traditional gender roles, particularly women as caregivers and objects of sexual desire, and men as breadwinners and leaders. Violence against women and girls often stems from the impulse to punish those who violate these norms. Thus, we would hope to see advertising challenging rather than reinforcing them. In Caribbean ads, they were shown, women were shown with family or children in domestic spaces and performing domestic tasks more often than men. Men, on the other hand, were more likely to be shown without members of their families. Women and girls disproportionately bear the burden of caregiving responsibilities within their households and workplaces that is often unpaid and undervalued. In Mexican ads, women were more likely than men to be portrayed in the home, parenting, and performing domestic tasks. Emerging evidence suggests that in some contexts, poor performance of unpaid care work was at times considered a justification for acts of violence against women, quote, because women are exclusively held accountable for it. In Caribbean ads, a higher percentage of women were, were visibly objectified and showed in, shown in appearance-based markets. Further, they were portrayed in revealing clothing seven times as often as men. When women are viewed as objects rather than as three-dimensional people, they're valued less in society and at a higher risk for sexual violence. The hypersexualization of women in advertisements may result in young women and girls feeling pressured to fit into unrealistic beauty standards, which can result in reduced self-esteem and increased self-objectification. In Mexican ads, women were also visually objectified and shown in appearance mar markets more often than men. And while we do see a smaller percentage of women in revealing clothing than in the Caribbean, it's notable that we also found no evidence, we also found evidence of young girls in revealing clothing and no young men or boys. In Caribbean ads, men had jobs and were shown working and were characterized as cool more often than women. Gender stereotypes are not only harmful for women and girls, but for men and boys as well, as they reinforce beliefs that their personal value, that their personal value stems from power, professional excess, and domination over women. In Mexican ads, men also had jobs and were shown more, working more often than women, again, failing to challenge ideals that expect men to uphold traditional masculinity. While advertisements can reinforce harmful gender norms, they also have the potential to promote gender equality and contribute to ending violence against women and girls. In both the Caribbean and Mexican studies, we did find evidence of some advertisements that challenge gender stereotypes, but we need to do more. Promoting positive gender norms is critical for achieving the sustainable development goals, including number five, gender equity, gender equality. Lasting change requires commitments from various cultural institutions. And as one of those institutions, advertising has a far reaching influence. Thus, we present, we present the following recommendations for the advertising industry. One, develop content that promotes positive messaging and challenges discriminatory gender norms. Two, bring gender and age sensitive advertising practices to the mainstream. Three, engage in advocacy regarding local advertising standards. And four, develop partnerships with gender equality organizations. Just happen to know one called the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, uh, Michelle um, and Meredith. And for everyone, uh, we will be posting a link to the study, which will be live. And we would really appreciate you checking it out you know, and sharing it. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we had an absolute privilege working with UNICEF on the first and largest ever advertising study looking at um, Indian advertising. And we've had great success and it was really embraced by the industry. So I would love to introduce our dear partner, Jitanjali Master, um, who is partnership specialist with UNICEF India, who can give you some updates about the impact of our report from 2021. Over to you, Jitanjali. Thanks so much, Madeline, and, and wonderful to meet everybody today. Uh, it's, it's great to be part of this discussion uh, and, and also wonderful to share experiences about the India story, which has been, um, which has been so motivating and, and, and amazing, actually. So, um, you know, in India, this partnership with uh, the Gina, Gina Davis Institute and uh, the study that uh, uh, Madeline just spoke about to understand gender stereotyping advertising was a massive opportunity to influence uh, and impact our extensive work in this area, realizing, and I think uh, Lauren and others have already given a background of why. Uh, what we uh, understood was, uh, however, that for any study and any findings um, from a study like this, um, and we've just seen and heard on, on the one in the Caribbean, and a lot of similarities in findings uh, are there. Uh, it, was, it was for us very crucial to identify a key stakeholder, um, you know, or, or create an ecosystem of partners who would, who, who would become champions and who would actually uh, be catalysts to influence the ones who are actually creating advertising and marketing content. Um, we had partners, UN Women, the Unstereotype Alliance, we had uh, civil society partners, an academic institution, and, and really the one I'd like to focus on and speak about uh, the most is the International Advertising Association India chapter. And the International Advertising Association in India uh, became uh, a key sort of uh, stakeholder, but also a champion uh, to take this discourse forward. Uh, they were with us through the research from inception, uh, even before the study uh, began. And they were very keen also to see how they can uh, take this piece through and grow it and make it bigger uh, to be able to to be able to actually put findings of the study to use. I'm going to very quickly go through four or five, uh, you know, um, outcomes, so to speak, that we've had uh, over the last uh, year and a half after uh, the study findings were out in India. Um, the first one was obviously that it really helped in creating an enabling environment. Um, it, it, while there was discussions around uh, stereotypes and advertising, uh, the findings from a study like this really was able to uh, focus, if I can say, on the nuances um, that, that often get missed. And it's really not just about the presence of, uh, you know, uh, equal uh, gender representation, but the nuances. And that came out and that uh, got visibility through various forums of course, the launch uh, as one like today we had in India, but post that a number of other events as well. The second one was the, the big thing, and that was the International Advertising Association in India, how they launched uh, a nationwide sort of um, digital campaign called the Voice of Change. And the Voice of Change for them really uh, was about uh, letting people consistently know um, in, in creative ways why there needs to be gender equality in advertising and marketing, but also using the study findings to be able to focus on some of those pieces. Um, the, the campaign has already reached 130, 140 million people in India, uh, and there's always amplification um, uh, with, with Unstereotype Alliance, UNICEF, UN Women coming together as well. The third uh, was guidelines on gender neutral advertising by the Advertising 
Standards uh, and Control Authority in India. Basis this study and the work that was done with the International Advertising Association over a while, um, there was focus on creating gender neutral um, guidelines. And that was actually embraced and launched by the uh, Minister for Women and Child in India, the government of India. And she actually launched that to, to let advertisers and, advertisers and marketers know that they must actually at least uh, refer to these guidelines uh, while they're actually creating advertising. But just as these guidelines were being made and the fourth piece was a self-assessment tool which is now in process by advertisers and marketers to look at when they are creating content, how can they self-assess? How can they, um, you know, and we know that the Unstereotype Alliance has a self-assessment tool that was being um, uh, referred to as well. And things that actually become very much part of the system um, when, when uh, content is being created and generated and not something that always, uh, you know, needs a, a document to refer to, but really something that they start thinking about themselves. And that's in process. And finally, what I'd like to share is that, you know, this has become uh, like an ecosystem, a creation and an ecosystem coming together to take this agenda forward. What started off with one study has really aspired and, and moved big and um, involved a lot of stakeholders coming together and working together in semblance all the time to uh, to shift the needle, uh, to move the needle. So um, we are very excited about how the process moving in India and uh, really excited about today as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jitanjali. And it just proves that collective impact can work, that the industry can embrace these findings and these recommendations, and that we can have great reach and great global impact. So to build upon uh, our, our findings and this discussion today, I have the privilege of moderating a, a brief panel discussion. So I'm going to ask all of my panelists to just pop on their cameras and in no particular order, I'm going to introduce my co-moderator, Ashley Lashley, who is the Youth Advocate for UNICEF, Sarah Denby, Head of the Unstereotype Alliance, Secretariat, UN Women, and just an all-around fabulous gal, uh, Misha Brown, President of PCI Media, who's been a wonderful partner of ours, Ari Mendelbaum, Marketing Director, Colgate Palmolive, Mexico. And last but not least, Lucy Gaffney, Digicel, Group Board Director. Welcome everyone. It is such an honor um, and privilege to have you all here today. And actually, Ashley, uh, being our youth uh, ambassador, I wanted to turn it over to you and have you just talk for a few minutes about your experiences with the media and why this topic is so meaningful for you. Thank you, Madeline. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I just want to commend you all for the effort in which you're doing to bring awareness to gender-based violence and especially linked to adolescents, girls, and youth. And I am of the utmost opinion that the media has a major role to serve as a catalyst in changing the attitudes of people and the stereotyping of women. And I say this because I remember clearly that I became a, vet, a victim of journalistic stereotyping when I became a contestant in the Miss World Barbados pageant at just the age of 70. However, there are some sectors of the media who I believe should know better and they took a position essentially that as a young woman coming out of a marginalized community, that I did not deserve to be crowned. And this is just general stereotyping of young girls and young women who come out, out of these marginalized and stigmatized communities, not only in Barbados, where I live, but around the world. And obviously I was humili humiliated and shocked at the extent of how the media could essentially single out 
me to lodge this type of insult on my integrity as a young woman. And most of you know the old adage of beauty and brains, which is a very rare combination that is often overlooked by the media. And stereotyping the perception is through media is that most young women who entered beauty shows, pageants, only have a good body, a pretty face, and no brains. And for me, this is general stereotyping, media stereotyping, and global stereotyping as well. And this phenomenon, I truly believe it must be obliterated at all costs. And I am honestly of the view that you cannot stereotype persons based on how they look, where they come from, and assume that this is the basis of their personalities. And after experiencing this type of discrimination against me as a woman, I was determined to shape and reshape my own destiny. So I began on a journey that will also build my self-confidence and determination, knowing quite well that it would also have a ripple effect that will also impact the lives of other young women like me, particularly those young girls and women that live in poverty-stricken communities or country. And that is why my first question of today goes to Miss Lucy Gaffney. Miss Gaffney, my question to you is, the power of social media is hard to dismiss. Digital technologies have become increasingly integrated into our daily lives. Digicel Group is present in 25 markets in Central America and the Caribbean. How can digital advertising promote positive messages that challenge harmful norms and stereotypes? And how can these messages be relevant across different markets? Okay, thank you very much, Ashley. And, and thank you for sharing your, your own story. Um, it's very powerful. And also to thank um, the Gina Davis foundation and uh, and also spotlight and unicef it's been really interesting um to go to your second question first ashley um i mean uh, are there stereotypes and and stereotypical um, negative advertising is is prevalent across the whole world but we are in all of those markets in the caribbean and central america and we are very focused on uh, having hyper local advertising so we're very conscious about the need that you know it's not a region as far as we're concerned it's not a region it there are individual countries with individual social norms with individual cultural uh leanings so we we don't look at it as a region we look at it as individual countries but one uh, points that have been raised today which i think is terribly important is that with the rise of social media what has happened is that there is now uh, these algorithm algorithms that we all talk about that they determine what's put out on our phones, for example, or what's uh, what's put out on, on our social media. And my worry about that is that I don't think that, you know, machines and, uh, and algorithms actually have the ability to to pinpoint and to be hyper vigilant about stereo uh, negatives and harmful stereotypical uh, images. So I worry about that for the future. I think that stereotypical advertising is just sheer laziness. OK, and people who produce it should be just fired on the spot, quite frankly. What I do believe is that there should be greater collaboration between brands, between agencies. So that I mean, social media, if you work in the corporate world, it's all about engagement. And there is that's how it's it's gauged by how effective was my ad, how many times was it shared. But what we can see is that when that goes unfettered, like we saw recently in the horrendous Balenciaga ads, where they used children who were dressed in bondage and who had uh, teddy bears who had chains on them to sell adult advertising, it was outrageous what happened there. So there is a greater collaboration needed between brands, between their advertising agencies, so that a feminist way of thinking, the feminist uh, approach to advertising is not going to be ignored and is going to be at the center of that whole dialogue right across the spectrum of advertising. So um, 
I hope that answered that answered your your question. Thank you so much, Ashley, for that question. Thank you, Lucy, for um, your your answer. And so we were talking about targeting, you know, different regions, different countries, and we also have to target and take in consideration all types of marginalized people. So Sarah, um, we've had such a privilege working with you as a founding partner of the Unstereotype Alliance. And uh, there's been so much impact to the collective impact of the Unstereotype Alliance. And really talking about how media can um, share, you know, our, 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 our lived experiences. So can you talk a little bit about the work and how you're looking to drive change in Mexico and the Caribbean? Well, the Unstereotype Alliance, and by the way, thank you for having me and the privilege is all ours. Um, Gina Davis Institute and UNICEF are much valued partners of the Unstereotype Alliance. So it's great to be here. And we do have national chapters of the Alliance in um, Mexico and, and in India. So the work is really important and the insights are really important. Um, and I think in terms of how we're looking to drive change in all markets through advertising and media um, is evidenced in the way that um, consumers view advertising. So because when we talk about harmful social norms, we're really talking about behavioral expectations that we have of others and for ourselves in society. So this is where advertising wields huge influence in terms of its potential for progressive depictions of gender roles. But it's also where we see the greatest potential for damage when it's not progressive. Um, and that's where it's showing up in the data in all of these markets, particularly amongst young men. Um, so if I, I can talk about that a little bit, you know, often when we talk about and think about harmful social norms and gender stereotypes, our heads, especially at UN Women, automatically go towards women and girls. But in fact, we've been leaving men behind and that is showing up in the data. We've got some really concerning findings from the Gender Equality Attitude Study, which is a biennial study across 20 countries now that UN Women produces with the Unstereotype Alliance. And across 20 countries, gender equality is still viewed as more important by women, but we're seeing more regressive views in younger men. So 40% um, of male respondents agree that a man's job is to earn money while a woman's job is to look after the house and family. And 51% of men think that women should work less and devote more time to caring for their family. And this view is held most fervently among younger men aged 16 to 19. 52% of them believe that a woman's place is in the home caring for the family. And 54% of men aged 20 to 34 believe the same. And those views extend beyond the family and the workplace. 58% of young men aged 16 to 19 agree that men are better political leaders than women. And one in four believe that there are um, there is justification to hit your spouse. So the idea that these old fashioned traditional views are dying out with older generations are simply not true. And what, when we examine those attitudes alongside what we're seeing in advertising, there's a really stark reflection. So our on stereotype metric data, um, which measures how well a piece of advertising presents female and male characters, men are still overwhelmingly being shown in traditional roles. Only a tiny 9% of ads showed men in non-traditional roles and one fifth showed men with diverse body types, for example. So that suggests a really homogenous depiction of men in advertising, including what it means to be a successful or attractive man, a respected man, a family man. So if social norms are the behavioral expectations we have for ourselves and others, there's clearly a huge potential for advertising to focus hard on the progressive portrayals of men because we are indeed leaving them behind and there are many social impacts we see as a knock-on effect of that particularly and not least of all in Mexico and the Caribbean. Thank you Sarah. Uh, we have a huge runway uh, to really 
redefine and reimagine what it means to be a man, you know, and a boy. Over to you, Ashley. Thank you, Madeline. And I totally agree with everything Sarah said. And my next question will go to Misha Brown, the president at PCI Media. Misha, my question to you is, advertising still does not depict reality. The average consumer does not see themselves in advertising. How do we ensure that creative departments are diverse and organizational cultures are inclusive so that these perspectives can create an authentic, and relevant content and communication? Well, first of all, I want to echo the thank yous that everyone else has shared to UNICEF, to the Spotlight Initiative, uh, to the Gina Davis Institute uh, for inviting us here for this important conversation. And, you know, I just would love to, in response to this question, tag back to uh, some comments Jen, uh, Tali made about really having a group of stakeholders coming together to really think about transitioning norms, uh, you know, and Lucy, you spoke to this as well, transitioning norms in a sector. You know, at PCI Media, you know, we're all about uh, behavior change. And I like to say behavior change is about learning and everyone in an ecosystem is a learner. So if we want the audiences for advertisements to behave and think differently, we also have to back up and think about who else is in that ecosystem. And advertisers are in that ecosystem and they're people too, and they're learning too. And they're working with a set of norms that have been accepted, an accepted way of behaving in their industry that quite frankly have gotten results for them over the years. So when we're thinking about how do we move really powerful data like that that has been surfaced in this study into practice, it's really about, from our perspective, bringing together those marketing departments and really mentoring them uh, on this you know, road of change. And we're really grateful uh, for our partnership uh, with UNICEF and the Caribbean because we've been able to do that with local production firms as we've been working on some applications of some spotlight initiative uh, work in the Caribbean uh, to, to work with firms who, who maybe in past, you know, their work has not uh, represented the best that we would want to see about uh, gender representation you know, uh, non-binary, you know, really positioning women and girls in the best light, really rethinking how we're uh, portraying men and boys and really working with them to rethink how they can do the work that they need to do to get the impact that they need while also not sacrificing the pro-social aims that we want. So really it's about, you know, from our perspective, really thinking about, the, the capacity development that really needs to happen at the sector level uh, so that we don't skip over that important uh, constituency. Thank you so much, uh, Misha. And um, Ari, I'm gonna go over to you. So uh, Colgate has been uh, powering um, our smiles for nearly uh, 200 years. Um, can you give us some insights specifically about how you've been able to uh, break stereotypes, redefine stereotypes, and also championing what's behind a woman's smile? Can you talk about the trends um, uh, and the brands and ads that are defying these traditional stereotypes, which we know consumers are actually rewarding those companies and those brands um, that are reflecting uh, a more integrated and diverse society. Thank you, Madeline, and hello to everyone. Again, I'm privileged and passionate to be here with you. Uh, and uh, I do have to say, I mean, first of all, I so much uh, loved what uh, Misha said, that it doesn't start with the advertising. It really starts with the heart and the soul of the companies, because if you really believe in it, then th that's the way that the brands will reflect uh, what the company stands for. Um, uh, our brands in Latin America, specifically in Mexico, range from a, seven, a 70 to 100% penetration, which means that we reach pretty much every household in the country. And we, we do have 
um, an obligation to have a point of view in the society and to change something for the better. And um, what we have learned is that every single ad that we have put out there that has a point of view in the society and push the society forward uh, has better results for us in terms of engagement. So uh, our brands go beyond Colgate. I'm going to give you some examples on, on Colgate, but also on other brands that we manage in the portfolio. Uh, and, and I would start with the uh, lace speed stick, which is uh, a, a deodorant. Um, and I mean, it, it's about Barbara Blade and it's about uh, 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 breaking stereotypes and dare you to do something and to break barriers. Uh, and, with, and, and, and the advertising is about when you dare, when you challenge society uh, and when you're different and it doesn't matter that your body type and it doesn't matter if you don't have long hair, uh, as long as you do what you want, you can achieve the world. And your uh, it's Barbara Blade makes you unstoppable. And, and that's one of the ways we do it in the deodorant market. Um, in the same way, we're trying to, to change uh, um, the stereotypes with our handish, for example, Action, which is about women in action. And uh, in, in one of our advertising, the message is, uh, she's managing a business and she says, uh, in my, my business is an example of how a woman fights for her family, can achieve whatever she wants. Uh, and, uh, and again, it's not that, um, that this is only the soul and the heart of the company, which is reflected through everything on all the programs that we have uh, internally, but we have found that this is the best way to connect with society out there because they really believe in it. And because we're having a point of view and we're trying to make a change. Uh, and in the case of Colgate, uh, um, that it's not about the, uh, the, uh, the stereotype, but it's about inclusivity. Uh, it's about the strength of the smile. Uh, and it's, it's really about accepting uh, different people, no matter how they are. And uh, whether they have a disability, like a Down syndrome, uh, or our latest advertising that had a, a terrific score, it's about uh, a, a, a child that uh, doesn't, um, that has a disability, visual disability. He comes into a classroom, he smiles, and there's a girl that, uh, that, that smiles back at him, and then his life changes at school. And it, it's really about having an impact and saying, this is the strength of a smile. It's not about a beautiful white smile that it's for a magazine. It's really about the strength of a smile. And if you don't have the best teeth, and if you have like a totally separated teeth or you need braces, it's really about the, the, the reflection of your soul. And that's the strength of, of your smile. So, uh, I mean, in, in summary, I, I could go on and on, um, on, on advertising that we have in which we're passionate. But coincidentally, the, the best results that we have on advertising is the ones that have a point in society and are trying to change something for the better. And that is the reflection of all the communication and all the, all the programs that we have internally, uh, both in the company, but as well with the advertising agencies in which we partner with. Uh, and I was checking with them what are the, the, the programs that they have in order to, uh, to push women forward into leadership positions. And, and it's amazing how uh, WPP and Colgate have um, uh, partnership in, uh, in all these programs in order to change the way we behave internally. Uh, and, and if you see these two companies, the soul and our hearts are there. And the advertising is only the reflection of that. Thank you so much. So clearly you've talked about the social imperative, but there's a business imperative and ultimately doing good is good for business. So I do want to thank Ashley, my co-moderator, and, and all of our panelists um, for your insights and for joining us today. And now I would love to invite Javier Martos, Regional Chief Private Fundraising and Partnership at the Latin America and Caribbean Regional Office for some closing remarks. And in terms of some housekeeping, the report is accessible on the cjane.org website right now. You can also go to at Gina Davis org and also at UNICEF um, to access a link to the report. And we would just so kindly ask you to please share the study with all of your friends, with your family, with your colleagues, and we're available for you. So for any of our brand partners, 
global agencies. Um, we are here to come to you to present this study. So please um, reach out to us. So with that, um, Javier, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we want to close this discussion by celebrating the huge interest from everyone joining us today. Thank you very much to be with us. Positive change requires ambitious collaborations among diverse stakeholders, in particular from the marketers and the advertisers, which are with us today. But change is also good for business since a growing group of people are more likely to consider or even purchase a product after seeing an ad which they consider to be diverse or inclusive. We would like to invite you all to reflect and take action when connecting back with your regular work after this online event. First, to improve the current mechanism of advertising production and make sure that the, we start promoting gender stereotypes and negative image of women. Second, create more inclusive portrayals of all people. Third, to design new ways of communicating and positioning your brands, proposing new narrative on gender roles and equality, including empowering women and girls, of course, but also promoting positive masculinities. Fourth, and finally, to ensure that non-dominant groups are reflected in the ads and also involved in the creation of advertisement because representation matters. Again, we hope that this report will encourage you all to engage with us and with your communities of practices in Mexico, the Caribbean, and the rest of Latin America. Thank you all all the speakers today, to Genia Davis Institute, to our partners, and to all participants for your active engagement to eradicate harmful stereotypes in advertising and to prevent violence against women and girls in our regions in LAC. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. And to everyone who has taken time out of their very, very busy day, we also want to wish you a very blessed, safe, healthy holiday and wishing you joy and prosperity for a new year. Thank you so much, everyone.